Okay. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Probably I will start the, the lecture now. The time flies very fast. Now week four. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, before I start, just want to check whether I am audible or not. Maybe say yes in the Zoom chat. Yep, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Welcome everyone uh, to the FIT2107 software quality and testing again. Uh, this is Kla, uh, Tanti Tam Tawan, I'm the CE and the lecturer. Today is uh, week four now, and then we're gonna uh, cover the topics about uh, black box uh, testing technique, right? And there are different types of the black box testing technique as well, and we will talk about that today. But before I start, I will just uh, uh, talk about the student feedback from the week three a little bit as well. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot everyone for providing the feedback uh, to the um, <clears throat> unit, right? And it seems that uh, uh, the unit testing challenges are quite uh, positive and everyone like it. Uh, CICD is a little bit uh, more challenging, but still uh, most of the students are still uh, love uh, that kind of practical uh, hands-on experience as well. Uh, because uh, based on the uh, in in the ED stem right, there's a analytics uh, classroom progress as well. So when I look at this one, it seems that most of the students uh, are quite uh, uh, progress well with the um, what is that the, the the unit testing okay. But uh, for the CICD part, this one surprisingly only twenty five percent of the student can complete it. But uh, this is totally fine because uh CICD is one of the uh, unit learning outcome. So I encourage everyone to keep working on it, try to uh, complete this task uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we, we don't have the, the uh, we don't have the deadline yet for this one. Okay. So uh, we, I understand that different uh, students have uh, different uh, uh, learning uh, speed, right? So uh, I'll try, I suggest that uh, everyone try to uh, study a little bit more, uh, try to debug the code, uh, figure it out how to complete this one by yourself, okay? But I understand that uh, there are some hiccups in the instructions and probably it's not generalized to every operating system. It was designed for Mac, but not uh, for Windows. There are some uh, missing command lines, the command lines are different, all that kind of thing. So, I uh, I received this feedback and uh, we try to address this one uh, as much as possible. So what we will do is that we will uh, develop another CICD tutorial video uh, and we will yeah upload it uh, later this week as well once we uh, once we finish it. Okay, <clears throat> because the CICD part is quite technical and. Uh, I understand that probably some of the students need uh, more time or need more support from the teaching team as well. Uh, we set up the Zoom consultation here uh, every day, actually, uh, Monday to Friday. Uh, you can uh, find out uh, which, uh, which uh, consultation hour uh, is suitable for you, and then you can uh, seek support from our uh, tutors as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so I will start uh, yeah, the, the lecture now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Before we start, um, this is uh, the same slide that we talk about, uh, uh, that we mentioned in week two, okay, which is about uh, what is the software testing and what is the landscape of the software testing as well. But I'll just uh, explain slowly again to ensure that everyone gets uh, what does it mean, okay? So, Testing is just the process of the uh, testing software. And there are two types of the software testing. One is the static testing and the, another one is, is the dynamic testing. What is the difference, right? Static testing means that is it, it, uh, we want to test a software without executing the code. Dynamic testing, we test the software by executing the, the code, okay? So when we do the static testing, 
uh, there are a few approaches that we can do. For example, code review, informal review, pair programming, uh, code inspection, uh, walkthrough meeting, or whatever, right? So during the code review process, during the walkthrough uh, or in code inspection session, uh, we don't execute uh, the code at all. So that's more like a static testing. And most of the defects that we can file here, right? It could be like, a, I mean, if uh, it is a simple logic uh, function, uh, logical uh, function. We probably can discover some logical errors as well, or but most of the time I assume that uh, most of the code review or code inspection uh, technique here would discover like a uh, documentation issues, uh, maintainability issues, code readability issues, that kind of thing, okay? So it's not uh, more towards the maintainability of the code rather than the functionality of the code, okay? Yeah, so that's the uh, uh, static uh, software testing. But when we talk about the dynamic software testing, we actually execute the code, but there are different types of the uh, dynamic testing technique here, okay? Dynamic testing, uh, execute the code. This is what we have done in the week three before, like write the unit test, we write the test cases, and then we, uh, uh, execute it, right? So this is what we normally do. And this can uh, check the uh, functionality correctness of the uh, of each method as well, whether we implement every uh, functions or not. That's a integration testing and whether the whole system actually work or not, right? We need to execute everything to ensure that uh, the software uh, meets the requirement and uh, works properly, okay? And there are two types of the dynamic software testing uh, technique here. The first one is the white box testing, and the second one is a uh, uh, black box. Okay, today we will talk about the black box only. And what are the difference here, right? Black box. So these techniques, I would say, okay. Uh, let let me let me re uh, rephrase a little bit as well. Dynamic and the static, execute or not, execute the code or not. But this is more like a, how do we decide the test case? We decide the test cases based on uh, looking at the code or not, or without looking at the code. When without looking at the code, it means that we just decide the test cases based on the specification, based on the requirement, that kind of thing, okay? So black box is the technique to decide the test case based on the specification without looking at the code at all. It doesn't mean that we don't execute the code, okay? We just look, don't look at the code and decide the test cases. White box, we look at the code and then we, we, we decide the test cases. Does that make sense? Dynamic and the static, execute the test case or not, execute the code or not. White box, black box, we actually uh, is a technique to decide the test cases, black box, don't look at the test case, no, sorry. Don't look at the code, okay? Decide the test cases without looking at the code. White box, we decide the test cases by looking at the code, okay? Clear? Maybe say yes in the Zoom chat and then I can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, today uh, we're going to learn about uh, uh, black box uh, software testing. This is what I mentioned before, okay? Black box, uh, uh, white box technique, uh, we look at the code and then try to decide the test cases. What are the expected input? What are the expected output? And try to, uh, like, uh, the goal of, he, uh, of the white box testing is that we want to, uh, like, uh, exercise the code by every line of code. I mean, um, achieve like 100% code coverage, that kind of thing, okay? But for the black box testing, we want to decide the test cases without looking at the code, but look at the specification only. So we only decide the test cases based on the specification, and then we test, uh, we, we implement the code later, all right? Okay, so yeah, black box testing uh, by definition 
it means that we want to examine the functionality of the software system without having access to the internal details of the source code at all. So it we only for black box testing technique only focus on the uh, expected in the it, the input uh, and the expected output and try to uh, validate the behavior and the functionality of the software system or the functions right whether it meets the requirement or not. Okay. And the goal, yes, uh, to identify the defects, error, discrepancy, improve the, uh, and it has lots of benefits. Uh, for example, improving the overall quality of the software system. But do we need both types of tests or not, right? So uh, normally this is what, uh, what happened. Um, let me get the, the pen here. This is the black box uh, software testing, okay? We, this is the scope of the specification, right? And then when we decide the test cases, we can identify, probably this is what we implement, okay? When we implement it, but if we don't capture every requirement, then we may, uh, we, with, when using the uh, black box uh, software testing technique, right? Probably we can detect some missing functionality, okay? Uh, this is when we do, um, but, um, but the, oh my God, draw, okay? So when we use the black box here, we can detect the missing functionality. Let's say uh, spec, uh, uh, gym eligibility, the, the logical logic here is that um, we, it should return true for, the, uh, for a person who is uh, uh, between uh, 18 years old and the 65 years old, okay? But if we don't, implement correctly, uh, we may not uh, uh, test it well, right? So, that, okay, let me refresh again. <laughs> uh, okay, clear, let me clear this one again. Normally, what, what happened is that at the beginning, this is a specification. And when we implement the software, probably there are some areas that, uh, that are missing, right? We don't implement it. And such uh, missing functionality may not be able to detect by the white box testing technique, but can only be detected by the black box testing technique, okay? But, uh, and this is the implementation. On the other hand, when we use, uh, when we look at the code, we implement it, okay? Probably when we look at the code, we may, we, we may be able to uh, decide the test cases to detect unexpected fun uh, functionality. For example, whether the, if we, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, if we implement the edge here, right? To get the input uh, integer only, probably the integer uh, data input here may not be written in the specification, but it is written in the code. So when looking at the code, we can handle the, the valid, validity of the input uh, value uh, eff effectively. For example, in this uh, edge function, maybe we can say whether the, the input data is in the right data type or not, is it integer or not, or is it string or whatever, right? So once we do that, uh, we can handle the unexpected functionality of the uh, implementation here, okay? In short, uh, missing functionality can only be detected by the black box testing technique, but not the white box. Unexpected functionality uh, can only be detected by the white box, but not the white box. Can by the uh, white box, but not the black box. Okay, is that clear to everyone? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and this is just a recap. When we decide the test cases, normally we are looking for, uh, uh, what is that here? Um, the input, right? The input, what is the test input and what are the uh, expected uh, output, okay? Expected test output. This is what we are looking for when we decide the test case. I'm sure everyone uh, have a deep understanding of this already because most of the students, when I look at the class progress there, uh, most of the students, 80% of the students already practice the unit testing. So I'm sure everyone get this point. Yeah, 
black box testing techniques. Uh, there are different approaches, and one of the uh, common approaches, but not systematic as at all, is called ex exploratory testing. Okay, so what does it mean here? It means that uh, we it is a manual dynamic and script approach uh, to software testing. It is not systematic at all. It is on the fly. What do we mean is that we just explore, uh, keep exploring the program, right? Let's say we have uh, the specification here and then we just uh, decide the test case. Okay, randomly, we just explore and try. This is the uh, expected input. This is expected output and decide it. Design. This is what we do at the moment, and it's not systematic at all. Probably the, the downside here is that we may miss some of the edge cases, uh, edge test cases, right? Uh, so we will talk about that later. So this is what we do uh, last week, okay? Exploratory testing. We just decide the test cases, okay? Yeah, without, look, uh, without looking at the code at all. Uh, and, but what are the, the problems here, right? When we decide the test cases, whether, uh, I think the key point here is that whether, how, no, how can we decide the most effective test cases, right? The effectiveness is quite important here. Uh, what does it mean? Let's say we're gonna test a summation function, okay? That takes uh, the two integer, okay, sum, okay, two value here, all right? We have A and B. The integer, what is uh, the, dom uh, the, the input space? Because this is an integer, so uh, the, the A uh, variable here, it has uh, two to the power of 32, right? That's the input space. And because we take two input here, so that means we will get like, a, uh, what is that, two to the power of 64. So that's like, a, that's, a, that's a big uh, combination if we want to test everything. Right, uh, and then when we decide the test cases to test the summation function, we can try like uh, for example, uh, input one and one. One plus one equal two. Two plus three equal five. Five plus five equal ten. We we can keep like uh, decide that kind of test cases. That's more like a exploratory testing, mode, right? But it's not effective at all because at the end of the day, we are end up like uh, testing the same. Uh, part right the same uh, class the same uh, scenarios that means this is uh, like uh, what is that uh, valid input this, we are testing the same thing so is that uh, effective or not probably not right because uh, it is quite redundant yeah test case are redundant but if we select the, the test case like this right we test uh, we decide the test scenarios. I mean, the most effective test cases should capture the various scenarios, a diverse set of scenarios, right? We look at the positive uh, input uh, integer, uh, input integer here, positive, test the negative, test the zero. Probably in reality, uh, testing like uh, these three test cases may be more effective than testing this one, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So. When we decide the test cases, we should capture the, uh, the, the various uh, test scenarios as much as possible. That's quite effective, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we so it's not the so the then the test cases are not redundant at all. Mm -hmm. So what we are going to cover to the today here is that uh, uh, these are the techniques uh, uh, for the black box testing. We can decide the decide the test cases uh, without without looking at the code at all. We just look at the specification only, and then we'll go through uh, the uh, a lot a lot of uh, examples uh, today together. Okay, um, and yeah. So in short, um, black box testing technique, right? There are a bunch of techniques. For example, random testing, equivalence partitioning, boundary value analysis, decision table, category partitioning, combinatorial testing, pairwise testing. We will not cover everything today. We will just cover only the first uh, four techniques for today's lecture. Only. All right. Random testing technique. Basically, sometimes uh, people just call a fuzzer, fuzzing, that kind of thing. Uh, the 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 concept is quite easy. The goal is uh, to randomly generate inputs to break the program. That's it. Nothing more than that. Randomly generating input is that uh, let's say if we write the program 
probably not Python, we write the summation function in C, right? In C, C program. And then uh, what is that? Is a, there are some issues about uh, uh, like a data type, uh, handling, uh, memory allocation or whatever. But when we randomly generate the test input here, uh, we just want to break things. And the randomly generated input here could be like one, one A as a string or A1 or whatever. It can be any link as well. That's how we randomly generate things, okay? Randomly, no, sorry. Randomly generate the test input in order to break the programs. Whenever we can break the program and it means that uh, the program has a bug, okay? So with when we use the random testing, we don't need to uh, use uh, our brain. Uh, it's not systematic at all. Okay, and uh, but uh, in this within this unit, we will not uh, mainly we will not uh, mainly focus on the random testing. We will focus on the other things. Okay, later on. Okay, so if you want to find more information, uh, you can check this kind of website as well. Uh, it is a book, fasting book, uh, which is uh, very, very well written by Professor Andre Seller. Okay. Random testing, what, what are the, the key characteristics here? Right? Basically, we want to randomly generate the test input. It can be number, it can be string, it can be anything. And we can, uh, and we, we just want to test uh, the expected behaviors here, whether we can break things or not. But when we run the random testing, right, there are lots of uh, issues here as well. When we uh, generate the test input, we don't know whether the test case is uh, what we don't know what is the expected output, right? We, because the goal of the random testing just generate the randomly generated test input and we don't know the, the expected output at, at all. So that's why it's called lack of test oracle because we don't know the ground truth, whether uh, it should be passed, it should be failed, it should return true, it should return false or it should return five or whatever, right? So that's the issue, okay? That's one of the limitations. That's why uh, when we do the random testing, we don't care about the expected output. We only care about whether we can break things or not, whether the program crash or not. That's the key goal of the random testing. And this is one of the limitations. Another limitation is that it is non-deterministic in nature. Uh, it is random. We test today, we can break things. If we test tomorrow, probably it won't break it, right? So it really depends on the day, depends on your life, uh, depends on the time. Uh, it's quite random. Everything is random. It's not uh, uh, reproducible at all, okay? Yeah. So yeah, the testing results may vary across different test runs. Yeah, that's the, the, the two key limitations of the random testing. And actually, I would say another one is that we don't know when to stop testing as well, right? When we apply the systematic testing approaches, uh, we can decide uh, test case systematically. We know these are the boundaries, these are the edge cases, and we already tested, and then we are happy with that. But when we do the random testing, the input can generate like from one to million, and it end up testing the same class, same scenarios, and it doesn't go anywhere, right? So that's kind of a waste of time as well. Mm -hmm. But this is a very, very basic uh, random testing fuzzing. And uh, in, in terms of research, there are something more than that as well, but we will not cover uh, that thing, okay? <clears throat> now, the next technique, the second one, equivalence partitioning. Uh, so what, what is that? The goal is to divide, okay? That, that's the key concept here, nothing complex. The goal is to decide the test cases by dividing the input domain into valid and invalid equivalent disjoint classes or partitions. And then we select representative values from each of them to create the test cases. So this is how we create the test scenarios, different test frame, all right? And then we just test, we, de we decide the test case uh, based on each of the class here, okay? What does it mean? I will go through the example. Probably it, much, it is much easier. Okay, there are some principles here. Okay, you can read later as well. Okay, let's say about the gene. Okay, uh, let's say this is the specification, right? Uh, gene, okay. 
gym 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 and take the edge okay as an integer the goal we, we want to check whether the, that the person can apply for a membership or not and the gym is only eligible for a person who is aged between uh, 18 and 65 years old so it should return true if it is uh, if uh, that person is eligible or false oh, oh oh okay okay slow down all right or false okay otherwise okay follow the the principle here okay uh yep yep so we want to divide the input domain into the valid and the invalid disjoint classes okay and then select uh, uh, representative values from each class to create the test cases okay that's a key principle what we will do okay go back to the next slide what we will do the input domain here is the uh, uh, team okay team the input domain here is what is the age right this this is the input domain one one input domain and the age can be partitioned uh, can be uh, partitioned into uh, different uh, classes okay for example because uh, we we look at the valid and the invalid right so this is the invalid area uh, this is the age okay so no one can be younger than zero anyway. Everyone start with zero year old, okay? And then this is a valid class, all right? So, uh, and the age, uh, it should return true for the age between 18 and 65. We can draw like this, right? What we can get here, how many classes that we can get? Number one here, that's an invalid class, okay? Invalid input. No one can be younger than zero year old, okay? The second, who is still like a uh, like a teenager, uh, who is aged between zero and eighteen years old, okay, and this are the group of the people who are eligible for the gym membership. That's uh, between eighteen and the sixty five year old, and uh, this is the uh, the last one, right? For the person uh, who is older than sixty five years old, they are too senior. Okay, so we get four classes here. What we will do next is to select uh, the test case to test for each of the class here, okay? So we can randomly select uh, one input test case, uh, one, one test input, right, uh, the test case. The first class less than, uh, uh, H is less than zero. So we just te test uh, negative five here and it should return false. So for this one, we test the invalid class, okay? It cannot be negative at all. Then we test uh, the second class here, who is age between zero and 18, okay? And it still should return false anyway, because uh, the gym is eligible for the person who is uh, age between 18 and 65. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is that? Next, uh, this is the, the third class, okay? Then we select the, the test case for the third class here. We test 25, it should return true because uh, he's, uh, in, uh, who is, uh, his, uh, his age is between 18 and 65. And so then we test another one, 75, the, the fourth class here, okay? Which is the, in uh, not, not, actually, this is not invalid, right? It is the valid input. Okay, but uh, let me fix the slide a little bit. Yeah. It is the valid input, but it just returned true or false. Okay, that's it. Nothing more than that. This is a valid input. Okay, all right. That's all. Uh, does it make sense for the first example? The key goal, what, what we would do with the equivalence partition testing is that we identify what is the input variable, input domain. In this case, it's the gene, okay? No, sorry, the age, okay? And then we partition the input domain, that's the integer value, into valid class, invalid class, and the valid class, and into the scenarios here, okay? So in this case, we can uh, partition the input domain into four classes. One is uh, below zero, another one is between zero and 18, another one is between 18 and 65, and another one is uh, 
the last one is the uh, over 65 years old. Okay, does it make sense? And then select one test case to test it. All clear or not? Maybe say yes in the Zoom chat and then we can move on to the next example. Okay, thank you. All right, so next one, uh, thank you. Uh, next one, we'll talk about the David Jones uh, discount campaign, right? Uh, the specification here is that it should return 5% uh, discount if we purchase over $100 or 10% if we purchase over $200 or 20% if we purchase over $500, right? Or 0% otherwise. So what is the input domain here? Probably when we write the code, okay, let's imagine together, we should return the discount and the goal, uh, the input here should be the purchase amount, right? Uh, let's, uh, let's try to get the draw here. Okay, it should return the discount, okay, output, okay, output. And the purchase amount should be the input here. Oh, and then what we will do, we will need to uh, partition the input domain here into uh, different classes, right? Uh, because the purchase amount, what, what, what is the spec here? We have uh, $100, we have $200 and the $500, right? And can we purchase the, uh, the, the items? Uh, can the purchase amount be less than $0 or not? Probably no, it cannot be negative. Okay, so we're gonna draw the line here. All right, we have zero, we have 100, we have, uh, 200 and we have 500, right? So how many classes that we get here? Number one, oh, okay. Number one, number two, okay. Number three, number four, and number five. So we have uh, five equivalent partition here, classes here, right? And then we just, what's next? We will just decide the test case for each of the class here. That's it. So simple like that. Crystal clear, everyone. Okay. And these are the test cases. Okay. This one clear? Yes, then I will move on to the next one, to the next example. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, what is that? David John. And what is next? Uh, thermometer. Okay. Uh, do you catch a call or not? Right. So we're going to do some temperature. Uh, checking here okay the spec here is that if uh, the temperature is below 36.5 degrees it should display a blue light if the temperature is between 36 and uh 36.5 and the 37.5 degrees inclusive it should display yellow light temperature is between uh 37.5 degrees it should display a, a red light right so same what is the input domain here the temperature, and I hope this is uh, in Celsius, not Fahrenheit, <laughs> all right? Uh, then we, first, we identify the input domain, okay? Temp, okay, temp uh, in, uh, okay, Celsius, all right. That's the input domain. And then we partition the input domain into equivalent classes here based on the specification. So 36.5, uh, what is that? 30, 37.5, okay, that's all. Um, I should have zero here and that's all probably. Uh, so how many classes that we get here? Number one, number two, number three, and the number four, right? Okay, so any, uh, that's the invalid input, right? Non-number string, it can be anything, uh, character A, the input can be dictionary, it can be whatever. Uh, it depends, right? Or minus one. That's how we decide the test cases. And uh, the good uh, met, uh, the good program here should handle any invalid function. And for this test, it should return what? Uh, probably uh, is not written in the spec, but uh, in the during the studio, though, uh, we will say something as well. Okay. Okay. So in this case, we can. Uh, partition the input domain into four equivalent classes, the invalid one uh, here, and the second one uh, here, okay? The third one here, and the fourth one here. Easy, okay? All right, move on. 
Leap year. All right. Leap year. What does it mean here? Leap year is the year that has a 366 day instead of a 365. Okay. And normally it happens every four years. Okay. Uh, for any years that have uh, uh, 366 day uh, on the February month, okay, we will have uh, 29 days instead of 28 days. Yeah. This is uh, the by definition. This is what we know. For more details, uh, maybe check the Wikipedia. But if we translate this kind of sentence into uh, the computer science specification, okay? So we're gonna write uh, a leap year function, is leap year, okay? Is leap year here, where the input domain is the year. And we want to return true or false, okay? True if it is a leap year, otherwise false, okay? And what is a leap year? The leap year is the year that is divisible by four, unless it is a century year, okay? So that means the, the divisible by 100. And the century years are leap years only if they are divisible by 400. Okay, all right, that's complicated. But let's test some understanding. Sometimes it is hard. Let's write, uh, let's do some exploratory testing together, okay? Is leap year 2000, is that a leap year or not? Yes, it is leap year because it is divisible by actually both four, okay, and the 400, right? Is this leap year or not? 1900 here, 1900. It is not leap year because uh, it is divisible by four here, but, but also by 100, right? So it's not, okay? Is this leap year or not? 1964. It is leap year because it is divisible by four. Okay. 2004, is this leap year? Yes, it is. It is divisible by four. Okay. 1965 is not, of course, it's not divisible by four. And 2023, to, uh, this year, we have only 365 days. Okay. So it's not divisible by four. Right now, I hope everyone understands the specification, right? But still, sometimes it is hard and it is complicated, probably we should write some uh, pseudo code together, which we shouldn't, but uh, let's write, okay? Let's work on it together. So this is, uh, uh, then we can identify the classes easily, right? Uh, input domain, okay, it should be the year anyway. Let's write the pseudo code together. So based on the spec, if it is divisible by four, it should return true, sure, okay? And unless it is a century year, okay, what does it mean? It means that if it is not divisible by 100, it should return to, that's the uh, century, uh, it's a leap year. But if the century years are, century years are leap years only if they are divisible by 400, right? So it should not, uh, so what does it mean? If it is the divisible by four, okay, but not by hundred, then it is true. But if it is by hundred here, okay, and it is also divisible by four hundred, that this this part, all right, then it is a leap year, otherwise false. Okay, make sense. And if it is not divisible by four, it should be false anyway. It's not leap year. Does it make sense to everyone? Before I move on, yep, okay, cool. Once we get the uh, uh, simple pseudo code here, right? We can identify the part of the programs easily. I'm like doing the reverse engineer, okay? <laughs> which is not that great, but it it works. So what what is the 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 uh, exit uh, of this program here? We have this one, the, the first class. This is a second class, the fourth, uh, the third class, and the fourth class here, right? That's it. So we just uh, decide the test cases uh, based on this uh, exit of the program. Okay, we have four different classes here. If it is uh, divisible by four, but not by hundred, then it is leap year. If it is divisible by four, by hundred, and four hundred, it is also leap year. This one, okay, and this one. If it is divisible by four, but um, and also by hundred, 
but not 400. So it should be this one, non-linear, and not by four. It it is going to be this one. Okay, makes sense. And then we will just uh, decide the test cases based on these uh, specification and return. We know uh, the oracle whether it is leap year, it is uh, non leap year. Which one is that, right? Is that enough? Probably not enough, right? Because this is only what is that invalid class. This is only the valid, oh, sorry, no, not invalid. This is only the valid input, right? We should also consider the invalid input as well. What else it could be, okay? So what else it could be? It could be uh, a negative year, okay? The year cannot be in negative. The year can be like a five digits or not, probably not, it doesn't make any sense, right? The year cannot be in a non numbers as well. So the program should handle any alphabetical characters as well. Okay. Does it make sense? So in this case, we can decide the test cases. Just uh, we break the, the break down the input domain year into seven equivalent classes. And then we just have seven test cases to test the program. That's the minimum numbers of test cases that we can test. Make sense? Yep, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, in short, in summary, equivalent partition testing, we want to, uh, will be used to reduce a large number of test cases to in, into a manageable chunk, right? And we capture every possible scenarios, okay? Uh, like leap year, do we need to test like a, from the year 1000 to 2023? Uh, that's a 2023 inputs, right? Uh, test cases, we don't need to. We just have only, we just need only seven test cases, right? Uh, and then uh, we can, uh, and the, the approach is quite uh, systematic with a clear guideline without compromising any uh, effectiveness of the test case at all, okay? And we should also consider both invalid and the valid test input, okay? Okay, we should consider both aspect as well. And there are other ways of making equivalent classes instead of the range of values. For example, partitioning the real number into the numbers of decimal point, whole number, composite number, whatever. Okay, that we will not go through that uh, uh, that level of difficulty. Okay, so in this unit, I think we'll just focus on the uh, integer or maximum should be just uh, decimal point. Okay, uh, yeah, clear. Remove the annotated clear the drawing all right next step boundary value analysis right uh, the in uh, the the um the the key goal of this technique is that we want to identify the boundaries of the the input domain what and let's think about the gene eligibility right we already have the partition okay 18 and the 65 and that's the boundary of the input domain, okay? And normally there are a few terminologies here, okay? This is uh, what uh, they're like a on point, off point, in point, and out point, okay? What does it mean? Let's go to the next slide. Okay, let's take a look at this example. Let's say we want to test something. I don't know what is the, oh, okay. <laughs> it is a program to add the shipping cost when the total price is below 100, right? So when the total price is below 100, uh, uh, we will add uh, some uh, dev delivery fees. Otherwise, uh, we will not add it, okay? It will be complementary. So the input domain, what is that? Is the, uh, the total price. And uh, what is the boundary value? That's the hundred, okay? That's a hundred, is the hundred here. Previously, when we uh, use the equivalent partition testing, we would just uh, select the test input, right? Uh, randomly based on uh, within the class, okay? We can select 50, uh, 60 or whatever, but what we found here is that uh, in the here, they found that most of the number are the bugs uh, often happen around the condition boundaries, right? So, it and it is very tricky. Uh, if we implement the program here, just say accidentally use the less than or, or equal here, the program is buggy already. So that's why 
it might be better instead of randomly select the test uh, input within the class, we should test on the boundary instead, okay? So in so to do that, we should uh, focus on the, uh, the uh, uh, two more uh, test cases, okay? Based on the boundary, okay? How to explain here? Uh, clear, clear the drawing, all right, mouse draw. Okay, next time I should get the iPad and the pen. Uh, yeah, so the on point, the on point, that's the boundary uh, uh, value, okay? Uh, the on point, 100, okay? And the off point here is uh, 101. I would say like this, uh, let me think. Let me put this way, okay? Uh, there are two scenarios, let me put this way. Let's focus on this one first. That might be better. Okay. That might be better. Okay. Because this is the same specification. X is less than 100, right? The on point should be 100. That means it will be valid when uh, when X is uh, less than, what is that? No. <laughs> when X is less than 100, then that's the valid, uh, not, not the valid, but I mean the, the positive uh, class, the true. It should return true, right? To add the shipping cost, but otherwise false, uh, otherwise false, that's the off point, okay? X is less than 100, then that's the uh, add shipping cost here. That's the in point. Otherwise, it's called off point, okay? No, out point, okay? Out point. And uh, the the maximum value here normally is called off point. Okay, this is what we want to test ninety nine, because the shipping uh, the the total price is below hundred, right? That's ninety nine. We should add the shipping cost here. Okay, and normally we will test the boundary values. So the two boundary values in this case, it is going to be ninety eight and the ninety nine. Okay, for the on point. But for the out point here, we will test the 100 and the 101. So in this case, we should have four test cases, okay, to test just this uh, boundary value, okay? Does it make sense? Yep, okay, thank you. But if the, the, the specification is changed to X is less than or equal 100, right? So 100 is still, uh, what is that? Uh, is below or equal 100, then we add the shipping cost. Okay, that should be the, the, the in point here. Okay, so, okay, let's take a look at this one, all right? X is less than or equal 100, then we will add the shipping cost. Then that means the 100 will be the on point. And we're gonna test the 99 as well. That's the boundary values. We test two values here. And the off point here, we will test 101 and 102. Make sense? Okay. We test both sides. That's it. Simple like that. That's an example five. Okay. All clear. Yep. This is all what I already mentioned. Yeah. Let's talk about the group allocation. Okay. Oh, ah. Uh, if uh, you haven't got uh, a group for the assignment, don't forget to uh, uh, arrange that as well, okay? Um, yeah, for the group allocation, uh, uh, what is that? The, the specification here is that we have uh, is group valid, right? It should return except if the minimum numbers of the student is three, otherwise reject, okay? Okay, so what should we test here? The boundary value is, three, right? That's the easy specification. And what do we need to test? Okay, on the left and on the right. Left here, okay? So that means uh, the three is the on point, okay? Uh, what do we need to test here? We should test, okay, two, three, and maybe you can say four, five as well, okay? That's the boundary that you want to test. You can even have one here as well, that depends. All right, okay. Okay, that's it. Monash letter grade. Then, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this one, uh, with this uh, Monash letter grade, all right? So the input uh, should be an integer mark uh, range between zero to 100. It should not be more than that anyway. 
the expected output uh, should be the letter grade, okay? This is the specification at the Monash website. What do we need to test, okay? We can partition, uh, what is that? Partition the, uh, the, the input domain, which is here is the, uh, the, the mark, okay? In, I'm confused, okay. Uh, we, we can use the equivalence partition testing, okay? To partition the input domain into equivalent classes, uh, classes here. We can have a HD, D, credit, pass, and fail, and probably uh, invalid class as well, like uh, uh, minus one or 101, right? Uh, that's uh, above the zero, uh, above 100 and below zero, okay? And what should we test here? We should test the boundary as we mentioned before, right? We can test uh, minus one, zero, and one. We can test uh, 49, uh, 50, and 51, uh, this part, okay? And we can test uh, 58, 59, 60 for this one, right? And doing so, we will generate a bunch of test cases to test the boundaries of the value that we that uh, based on the specification. Okay, is that clear, everyone? This is how we decide the test cases based on the uh, input domain, and without looking at the code at all, we just read the specification, decide the test cases. Okay, yep. This is a little bit more complex now. Ah. So we want to, uh, let's say we are de designing a game, right? And the input is the scores and the lives, okay? Uh, given the score of player and its number of remaining life, the program does the following, okay? That's the two input, number one and the number two. And the output should uh, return the score here. If the, no, 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 uh, yeah, return the point here, okay? That's the output. So if the, what is the specification here? If the player score is less than 50, then it always adds 50 point on top of the current point. Otherwise, if the remaining life is greater than or equal than three, it triples the score of the player, otherwise add 30 points to the current point. So it's like an if else, if else condition, okay? So what do we need to test? We can test this part, okay? Little point, the score is less than 50. The output is that uh, we'll add 50 point uh, to the current point here. And when we have uh, the point, the, the score greater than uh, 50 here, okay, that's the second case here, uh, but not, not so much uh, life in the game, okay? When, then we will do this, and this is another scenario. Probably if we draw the diagram here, right? Uh, this is the first scenario, okay? And this is uh, the, the second and the third scenarios, that kind of thing, okay? That's how we, uh, sometimes the black box testing technique can be combined as well. You can use the uh, um, together. I mean, both uh, equivalence partition testing and the, um, what is that, the boundary value analysis, all right? Okay, another example. Credit card limit, right? So let's combine both uh, techniques together, uh, equivalence partition testing and uh, boundary value analysis. The spec is that uh, the minimum credit limit for the credit card application should be, uh, uh, is 500, right? So the credit limit should be at least 500 so they can uh, get the uh, approval for the credit card application. What is the input domain? Okay, uh, what is that? credit limit, okay? And what is the boundary value here? 500, right? So what should we test, okay? And normally credit limit, if we apply the equivalence partition testing, we need to look at the valid and the invalid classes. So the credit limit should be over zero anyway, okay? Uh, and below is the invalid class, all right? So we get, what is that? One, two, and the three, maybe three classes here, okay? Uh, what else? Uh, there's a three classes here. And then for the class one, right? Uh, you can just, uh, what is that? Non-number value or, or below, okay? You, you, then you can uh, apply the boundary value analysis, right? To decide the test case. It can be minus one, uh, zero and one, uh, 499, 500, 
501 that kind of thing okay yeah. this is what we do okay because it doesn't say clearly whether the input can be the uh, decimal number or not right but let's say if it is yes then probably we need to test uh, this is how we uh, decide the test cases uh, using the boundary value analysis on the decimal numbers right because the on point uh, is the uh, 500 then probably we should test uh, 499.99 as well and the 500.01 uh, right and the other class is the uh, non number values which can be string or whatever as well okay make sense everyone I'm aware of time. Okay, gym eligibility. Let's combine to everything together. This is what I mentioned before. Uh, when we use the equivalence partition testing, probably we just decide the test case randomly, just select one value represent representing the class. But if we use uh, the boundary value analysis, then we can uh, decide the test cases and test the program more rigorously as well. So because uh, the uh, boundary, uh, the, the, this is uh, the value for each partition, right? Uh, probably we can test like, what is that? Minus one, zero and one, okay? It should have zero as well. Okay, zero is here. Minus one, zero and one. We should test, uh, uh, this is uh, the partition here, 16, seven, 18 and 19, right? Okay, yeah. And 64, 65 and 66, okay? Yeah, we capture every class, every cases, and probably because this is the integer, so we should test the invalid input class as well. All right. Okay. I'm aware of time because uh, we are nearly, uh, we have only a few minutes left. Probably I would say that, uh, let me think. I would, I would try to complete everything. Probably the lecture today will be a little bit, uh, maybe five minutes delay. Yeah, but I think let's complete that. The last technique uh, today is called decision table, right? So the decision table is a software testing technique to systematically test different or all of the combination of the conditions and their associated uh, actions or the outcome. Basically, we just want to generate uh, all of the possible combinations. And when we talk about the decision, the it should return true or false, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, what does it mean? Let's say this is a, da, da, da. what is that? Let's say, what is this one? Username and the password. Okay, this is a login. Uh, no, um, what is that? Uh, user registration form. The input should be two, two things, right? Username and the password. Not, not not registration form, the login form, okay? The login form. Let's say this is the app, we have the username, we have the password, and this is a button, okay? Uh, so what are, the, uh, what are the combinations here, right? When we write the program, if the username is correct, if the password is correct, yes, uh, we, they can successfully log, log in, otherwise false at all. Uh, that means, uh, we can draw uh, four possible combinations, right? If we uh, 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 do the decision table here. So for the username, if we say uh, if the username is correct or not, so it can be either correct or wrong, right? True or false. So that's a two value, two by two, okay? Two by two, then we will get four. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. That's a basic uh, truth table. And that's why. When using the decision table, we can generate uh, uh, four classes uh, to test, okay? Make sense, everyone? Okay, so let's move on. Uh, yes, uh, this is another example. Let's say, uh, what is that? If we want to calculate the taxable income, right? Uh, how many uh, I can do the deduction? What is the deduction amount, okay? Uh, for uh, the taxable income. So the input, this is the input, right? Input variables, this is quite complex. And this is the output. This is a table already, okay, from this book. We just generate all of the combination here, right? If uh, someone is a single with this, with this, with that, uh, these are the, the uh, deduction amount. And then we can generate all of the uh, uh, 
decision table here. These are the results, okay? The, the decision table. So uh, we have one, two, three, okay? This is a three, uh, three values for this input. Spouse of uh, status of the spouse. Uh, we have a uh, claim, did not claim or whatever. I think um, if you multiply everything, all of the combination, you will probably you will get the, this uh, table, okay? Yeah. Okay, loan approval decision table, right? Suppose you are testing a loan approval system, the approval of a loan depends on the applicant, applicant credit score and the income level. Here's a simple decision table for these scenarios, okay? So the input here should be the credit score and the income level, and each of the input variable, uh, uh, input domain has two variables here, either high or low, or high or low. So in total, two times uh, two, you will get the uh, four combination, right? And these are the expected output, okay, that we want to test. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all, easy, okay. 13, uh, example 13, online shopping cart discount. So suppose you are testing an online shopping cart discount system, the discount applies, uh, depend on the user member status, either regular or premium, and the total purchase amount, okay? These are the two input variables. And next is the specification, right? For regular customer, a 5% discount is applied if the purchase amount is greater than 100, okay? Uh, otherwise, uh, no discount. But for the premium status, okay, uh, premium customer, 10% discount is applied if the purchase amount is greater than 100, otherwise 5%, okay? So we get, uh, this is the decision table for these scenarios. And then we can just uh, identify the test, test cases later as well, okay? Makes sense. Okay. I hope that I am at the right speed, okay? Uh, if I, I go through fast, uh, maybe, uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please let me know in the Zoom chat as well. But uh, last but not least, uh, uh, based on the, the first three weeks uh, student feedback, right? Uh, I would say that uh, teaching uh, software testing, uh, software, software quality and testing is quite difficult. If you look at the set two score, it's not uh, at the uh, great side at all uh, in the past few years. So this year we do like a revamp, uh, re, uh, the, the whole development, okay? We do the whole development of the unit and we try to make the unit more practical, more hands-on as much as possible to, uh, to ensure that the, the student uh, can actively engage with the unit content, that kind of thing. So this is part of the, the research, all right? Yeah, uh, this is part of the research. So uh, would you mind, uh, once you complete the, the, the studio today, or if you have time, uh, please participate in this survey as well. We will use the result to publish, uh, and we want to investigate better uh, the unit testing challenges that you are working on at the moment during the studio and the automate feedback, automate marking system, that kind of thing uh, that uh, we develop, uh, newly develop, okay? Uh, it's not provided by the ED STEM at all. This is uh, our uh, teaching innovative, and we want to know whether, how does it impact your learning? Is it helpful? Is it, is it not helpful at all? Yeah, if you have time, yeah, please try to spend roughly five to 10 minutes to participate in these uh, survey questions, and we will publish the results once we get the response. All right, uh, that's all for today. And one question, would you be able to update the slide on ED STEM? Absolutely. Yes, uh, we would do it uh, right immediately after I finish the lecture. And that's a summary of the today lecture. We talk about the black box testing technique. How is it different from the white box? We cover uh, four, uh, test, uh, four, uh, four black box testing technique. The first one, random testing. We talk about the equivalent partitioning testing, uh, boundary value analysis, and the decision table. We cannot test everything. It is too exhaustive. It is time consuming. So that's why we should test, uh, capture the most, uh, we should design uh, we should use the most uh, the system, systematic approach to effectively decide the test cases, okay? Uh, to cap, uh, to achieve the highest code coverage, okay? 
All right, that's all for today. And next week, we will talk about the category partitioning, combinatorial testing, and the pairwise testing. Okay, have a good day, everyone. See you in the uh, studio. Okay, bye-bye.